Good evening, everyone. My name is Chris Lawrence, and on behalf of the UCI Moot Court Board, I welcome you all to this year's final round, and thank you for joining us. The Moot Court competition is one of the most important educational experiences available to students here at UCI. This competition challenges students to write briefs, participate in oral advocacy, and critically analyze real world issues. Each year, the board chooses a case, some are live cases working their way through the circuits. Others like this year's case are fictional cases designed to analyze and test emerging legal issues. For many of our competitors, this is one of their first opportunities to apply doctrinal learning to a complex record. What you see today is a result of competitors' months-long research, writing, and oral advocacy. I've witnessed firsthand what these competitors have accomplished, and it is nothing short of amazing. We are thankful to the staff, faculty, and administration of UCI Law, as well as the Orange County and Los Angeles County practitioner communities. Without their help, this competition would not exist. I hope you enjoyed tonight's event, and thank you. Now I'd like you all to please join me in welcoming our Dean and Chancellor's Professor of Law, Dean Richardson. Dean, you're, you're muted. I thought that I wouldn't do that again. <laughs> So thanks everyone for, for being here for our 2021 Moot Court Finals. As Chris has stated, our students, our Moot Court Board have worked incredibly hard during these unprecedented and challenging times. And I'm sure all of you who are joining us this afternoon have experienced similar things. So thank you very much for showing up to help to support this very, very important moot court argument today. We're very excited about it. I know I am. It's always an exciting day uh, for me and also for our student competitors. And I'm very much looking forward to the arguments. Our finalists have competed hard to get here today against a slate of incredibly talented students. So I know that we're all in for a treat. Now, before I introduce our panel of incredible judges, I'd first like to thank all of the people who made this evening's event possible, especially in the midst of our global pandemic. So first, I wanna thank the president of our Moot Court Board, Chris Lawrence, and I'd like to thank all the other members of the board. They are Betty Kim, Sharon Bach, Michelle Emeterio, Matthew Hallman, Krista Millard, Tom Collins, Emily Abbey, and Henry Glitz. All of them have worked tirelessly this year to make this event happen. Um, and I thank them so much for all of their efforts. Next, I'd like to thank our faculty and our staff here at UCI Law. Each of them has been especially helpful throughout the process this year. And the words I wanna share next come from the Moot Court Board who wanted to ensure that the people I thank next receive recognition, and I agree. I want this group of people to receive re uh, recognition. So first is Professor, Professor Rachel Croskery Roberts. She is their faculty advisor, and according to the board, she is their rock and their all around problem solver. We could not have done this without her, says the board. Next is Professor Paul Hoffman. Paul Hoffman provided both trainings for oral arguments and brief writing to all of the competitors, and they thank you, Professor Hoffman, so much for all of your efforts. Next is Jillian Henry. Uh, she is remarkable. She organized this first ever virtual moot court final round argument and event. She also provided tremendous help with all of the logistics for this competition. And then, of course, there's Assistant Dean Jenna Jones, otherwise known as Dr. J, to the board and to the students. And she supported the board by communicating uh, to the school on their behalf, making all the announcements and guiding the board through the many COVID-related issues that arose. And finally, the board would like to extend their gratitude to the 25 professors who took the time to grade briefs. So thank you all so very much. We wouldn't have this event without all of your efforts. 
Now it is my extreme and great pleasure to introduce our three judges, the three judges who will serve on our panel this evening, and I'll do so in alphabetical order. So first we have Judge Kugler, who sits on the United States District Court for the District of New Jersey, and he was nominated by President George W. Bush in 2002. Judge Kugler sits in Camden, New Jersey, where he practiced law for the majority of his career. And after graduating from Rutgers School of Law Camden, Judge Kugler served as a law clerk to Judge Gary at the U.S. District Court for the District of New Jersey. He then served as an assistant prosecutor for Camden County, New Jersey, and also as a deputy attorney general in the Division of Criminal Justice for the New Jersey Department of Law and Public Safety. Prior to his appointment, Judge Kugler spent nearly 10 years working in private practice until he was selected to serve as a U.S. Magistrate Judge for the District of New Jersey. Judge Kugler also sits on the U.S. Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court in Washington, D.C. Thank you so much, Judge Kugler, for being here with us this evening. Next, I'd like to introduce Judge Wardlaw, who sits on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. And she was nominated by President Clinton in 1998. Prior to being appointed to the Ninth Circuit, Judge Wardlaw served on the U.S. District Court for the Central District of California. Prior to joining the District Court, Judge Wardlaw was a litigation partner in the LA office of O'Melveny and Myers, focusing on business litigation with a special emphasis on intellectual property and media defense law. While in private practice, Judge Wardlaw held leadership positions in the Women Lawyers Association of LA, in the Women Lawyers Public Action Grant Foundation, and in the Association of Business Trial Lawyers. And finally, while in private practice, Judge Wardlaw was also involved in numerous community, political, and governmental activities, too many for me to list this evening. Thank you so much, George Wardlaw, for joining us this evening and taking the time to do so. And finally, I'd like to introduce Judge Wright, who sits on the U.S. District Court for the Central District of California. And Judge Wright began his legal career as a Deputy Attorney General in the Criminal Appeals Section of the California Department of Justice. And during his three years in office, he handled more than 200 appeals before the California Court of Appeals and the California Supreme Court. Judge Wright went on to join Wilson Elser, an international law firm that specializes in all matters related to insurance. And he became the firm's first African-American partner and practiced as a civil litigator there for more than 20 years. And during that time, Judge Wright was also a volunteer attorney with the HIV AIDS Legal Services Alliance, where he handled housing and employment discrimination cases, as well as preparing documents for the terminally ill. In 2005, Governor Schwarzenegger appointed Judge Wright to the Superior Court, where he was assigned to the Substance Abuse Court in Long Beach. 18 months later, President George W. Bush appointed Judge Wright to the federal bench, and there he has spearheaded the first federal drug reentry court in California. So as you can see, we have an incredible panel of judges who are taking time to be here with all of us tonight. And with that, let me turn it over so that we can begin what we're all here for, our moot court finals. Thank you so much. The court is now in session. Chief Justice Wardlaw presiding along with Justice Wright and Justice Kugler. Thank you, Mr. Johnson, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Aaron Johnson on behalf of the petitioner, John Schmidt. And Your Honor, I'd like to request three minutes for rebuttal, please. You may, you may have that. Thank you. May it please the court. This is a case about detectives' unlawful interaction with an individual's most sacred and safe space, their home. And the right of a person's home to be free from unreasonable governmental intrusion stands at the core of the Fourth Amendment, which also grants heightened privacy protections over the home. 
Today, I ask this court to reverse the Court of Appeals denial of the petitioner's motion to suppress and find that testing a key on the front door of an apartment is an unreasonable search under the Fourth Amendment for the following three reasons. First, Detective Wilson committed a trespassory invasion of the petitioner's curtilage by unlocking his front door. Second, the petitioner had a reasonable expectation of privacy to a smart lock and the RFID chip embedded in this lock. And third, the respondent's desire to quickly identify the petitioner's home was not compelling enough to overcome the petitioner's privacy concerns. Counsel, this is jo Justice Kugler. Let me ask you a question, if I might. What exactly yes, is the privacy interest that you're seeking to protect in this, in this door lock? Thank you, Your Honor. In the petitioner's eyes, in the door lock, we're hoping to protect the home. In the petitioner's eyes, the front door lock is an extension of the home, and the home, as you know, is listed in the Fourth Amendment. And our goal today is for the court to identify the front door lock as curtilage of the home and therefore extend Fourth Amendment protections to it. Was it important, again, this is Justice Cougar, was it important that the door unlocked? Because what I'm, what I'm really getting at is this was the third lock that was tried. The first two, it didn't work. Do those two residents of those first two apart apartments have the same privacy interest that, that your client does? They do, Your Honor. The first, not, no one's doors should have been unlocked um, or should have, the, excuse me, the officer should not have been allowed to test a key on the front door of an apartment home. Um, we're in court today because this court has yet to consider whether or not a front door lock is curtilage of the home. So therefore, there was not a, a warrant was not required for law enforcement to interact with the front door lock. So their privacy interests were, are, were impacted. And most importantly, the petitioners were, were because in his case, his door was unlocked, which well, is it, not. Counsel, again, is it the, what, what is the privacy that you seek to protect? The fact that, that your client perhaps lived in this apartment, his address, is that, was that the privacy right that you're seeking to protect? Your Honor, two, yes, two things. The fact that his front door lock was interacted with and also that his home, his address was discovered through improper and, and in the petitioner's eyes, unlawful means by testing but, the front door, but how testing the key. How private is, is his address? How private is anyone's address? I mean, every day we're giving our home addresses to government agents. You file a tax return, you want a refund, you tell the IRS and the California state taxing authorities where you live. You want a driver's license, you want to be able to drive on the highways, you tell the the California Division of Motor Vehicles, where you live, things of that nature. So we're constantly telling people where we live. So why should we protect someone's address under the Fourth Amendment? Your Honor, so the petitioner is not asking the court to find a reasonable expectation of privacy in the address. We're focused wholly on the front door lock. Um, to your point, Your Honor, because someone's address can be discovered through far less intrusive means, the petitioner is troubled by the extra step that law enforcement took in this case and, and what they did by not seeking a warrant and instead taking a key and testing it into multiple doors to ascertain someone's address when Detective Wilson could have simply phoned in a telephonic warrant. She also could have had, had her officers stay at the apartment complex for longer and through process of elimination figure out which of the units no one came out of, and that would have been the petitioner's um, home. Mr. Johnson, or, Mr. Yes, Mr. Johnson. pardon the interruption, but does it matter to you that some of these uh, alternative methods uh, you uh, alluded to uh, from which um, law enforcement could have uh, uh, learned of his residence, does it matter that he has not kept uh, those particular matters up to date, that uh, DMV did not have a, a current address. Matter of fact, all of the addresses, uh, official addresses that he has on file were not up to date. And uh, at least in the materials that I have seen, there was no mention of an on-site uh, property manager uh, where you could knock on the door to apartment number one and find out uh, you know, uh, uh, where this gentleman lives. Um, so I, I'm just wondering what extraordinary measures did you expect law enforcement to go through 
uh, in order to uh, to learn this information. They'd already tried the usual stuff, so uh, that didn't prove very helpful. What else, Your was Honor? It? I'm sorry. What else? Uh, was your, to, answer, to answer your question, Your Honor, and in the petitioner's eyes, what we would have preferred was first and foremost for law enforcement to get a warrant to test the key on the front, on the front door of the apartment. Interactions with the home should be taken very seriously. And in the petitioner's eyes, law enforcement did not exhaust the multitude of less intrusive means, such as interviewing um, neighbors to figure out, do you know where the petitioner lives? Um, a simple line of questioning, a couple of extra days of searching and investigatory work could have revealed the address. The petitioner's license was not up to date as stated on the record. However, in the in the petitioner's eyes, that weighs in favor of his subjective expectation of privacy to his address. While, while addresses are free and floating around the internet and somewhat easy to obtain in our digital world, people still have the right to keep their address private if they so choose. And the CATS framework has the court look at both the subjective expectation of privacy and also the objective expectation of privacy as well. And counsel, I have a question for you. Which theory do you think is um, better for your case? Do you think the CATS expectation of privacy line um, is, is more favorable or do you think the jones hardeen line of trespass authority is more favorable to your client's position? Yes, Your Honor. The petitioner finds the trespass framework under Jardines more favorable to his position and um, if I would like to run through that analysis if possible. Yes, let me ask you to focus particularly on what exactly is the trespass, the common law trespass here? Yes, Your Honor. So the trespass here is the fact that Detective Wilson interacted with the front door lock by waving the key fob in front of the, the lock, which unlocked the bolt and, and took to life the different mechanical components in the lock. That itself was the trespass. And the first part of the trespass analysis requires us to identify whether or not the smart lock is curtilage of the home. In the petitioner's eyes, the smart lock should be considered curtilage because it satisfies all four of the factors articulated in U.S. v. Dunn by the Supreme Court. The first factor has us look at the proximity of the area claimed to be curtilage and how close it is to the home. In the petitioner's eyes, few items are more proximate to the home itself than the lock. We're also asked to look at the area within um, the enclosure and the mechanical components of the lock were surrounded by the door itself. The third done factor looks at the nature of the of use of the area that's claimed to be curtilage. And a lock is used precisely to bar unwelcomed injury, entry, excuse me, and the sophisticated electronic components that the petitioner chose to equip his door with make lock picking even more difficult. And the fourth done factor looks at the steps taken by the resident to protect the area from observation. And a smart lock, unlike a mechanical lock, which reveals some of its components, you can see the, um, the tracing of, the, of a keyhole and that's how lock pickers are able to pick a lock. The smart lock, on the, as you can see on the record, is flat and it's very conspicuous. So in the petitioner's eyes, by satisfying all four of the done factors, the smart lock should be considered curtilage of the home. Then focusing on the trespass, Your Honor, a physical trespass occurs when someone interacts with the curtilage and exceeds the implied license of a visitor, which Was only it, presents- Cancel, I'm sorry for interrupting, but what I'm trying to get at is with the, the smart lock, is there a need to even touch anything and does, it, does that matter? With the smart lock, Your Honor, there is not a need to physically touch the lock. And there was, in the petitioner's view, that does not matter because under Kylo, the door was open to what we call digital trespasses. There, officers who were in a helicopter used a heat seeking device to determine whether or not heat signatures were emanating from a home. Justice Scalia wrote that that, by, that, that was a physical intrusion or an intru um, a trespass, let's call it, underneath this framework. And if there, a trespass could be found in a helicopter thousands of feet in the air. In the petitioner's view, here, a trespass can occur just inches away from a lock using the RFID key fob. So in the petitioner's view, there was, an there was a physical trespass using the, dig the digital signal um, and also the lock was affixed to the door. Thank you. 
Yes. But let me let me ask you when you're on the Jardines issue. This is a little different, isn't it? In Jardines, I think we made a point of talking about the actions of the government agents discovering what was inside the home. The actions of this agent did nothing to discover what was inside the occupant's home, correct? Correct, Your Honor, because the door was um, simply unlocked and then relocked. Nothing was discovered inside the home, but the address was discovered. And following the fruit of the poisonous tree doctrine, if not for this unlawful intrusion by Detective Wilson taking this extra step and identifying the petitioner's home, all subsequent evidence would have not been discovered. So through the through the poisonous, the fruit of the poisonous tree doctrine, that evidence should be excluded. Well, no, no court has indicated that somehow it's uh, constitutionally impermissible to walk down a, uh, a corridor in a common area of an apartment complex such as this, right? There's nothing that was impermissible about that, right? Yes, under the Supreme Court, no court has found that to be impermissible. However, right. the First Circuit in... Sorry, okay. Ronnie. Okay, Let, let's, let's walk through this. Sure. So there's, no, there's nothing wrong with that. Indeed, uh, if, if someone were there to visit this gentleman, uh, they'd walk down that corridor to his front door, uh, knock at the door, uh, wait for a few moments to see if there was a response, and if no response, they would leave, right? Now... Uh, did the detective do much more than that? Walk to the door, uh, instead of knocking on the door, she waved a key fob in front of the lock, uh, saw that uh, the key fob activated or deactivated the lock, and uh, she moved on. Now, I know you, you, you uh, I think you're, You'd rather emphasize the uh, trespassery interest as opposed to expectation of privacy, but just to uh, to deal with that one particular issue, do you believe that even under cats that there is a reasonable expectation that law enforcement won't even do what was done in this case? Absolutely, Your Honor. So I'll answer your questions in, okay. in two parts. Okay. Um, to answer the question about did the did Detective Wilson do more than a visitor would? In the petitioner's view, she absolutely did because the implied license of a visitor only allows people to go to someone's front door, knock, wait to be received, and once they aren't, to politely leave. And Detective, and, and by no means to start trying keys on someone's front door to see whether or not they live there or to see whether or not they're home. And such conduct would shock the conscious and ironically cause people to probably call the police um, turning to the CATS framework and the expectation of privacy, in the petitioner's view, people have an expectation of privacy to their law. It is an item that seals their home off from the public. Without it, they would be unable to keep their homes private. And testing a key on a lock has a greater impact on a person's sense of security than it does utility for law enforcement because of the other means that we've discussed today to ascertain the same information. And that brings me to the third point that I brought up in my opening, which is that absent exigent circumstances, which were not present in this case, there was no risk of evidence being destroyed because the petitioner was apprehended, apprehended and handcuffed on the front lawn of the Oakview apartment complex. And Detective Wilson already had her suspect. So in the petitioner's eyes, it was not compelling enough to just quick, want to quickly wrap up the, the investigation by testing the key rather than phoning in a warrant or beginning to interview neighbors to find, or like, taking to the internet to find the same information. Do you think that without identifying precisely where the gentleman lived, that there would be enough information to get a warrant? The warrant yes, is going Honor. to be, the warrant is going to be specific with respect to the place to be searched, correct? Correct, yes, but the, so, the particularity requirement. Do you, believe, do you believe that it's reasonable for law enforcement to present to the magistrate uh, sufficiently reliable information as to exactly where this individual lives so that we know exactly where the warrant should be addressed. Yes, Your Honor. I feel like on these facts, the respondent had enough information to sufficiently fill out a um, application for a, a warrant. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Respondent I, okay, I, I missed it. 
what information uh, did the detective have to provide a precise location to the magistrate for the issuance of a warrant? Detective Wilson knew that the petitioner lived at that particular apartment complex. There are yes. only four units. Yes. And what I'm getting at, Your Honor, is that I believe there's a special circumstance here and that law enforcement could have flagged to the magistrate that we have a key fob in, in, in our possession. We would like to test it on a couple of, on the four units within the complex. May we have permission to do so? That's the extra step that the petitioner was looking for. And that is the kind of care that law enforcement should take before interacting with not only the petitioner's home, but other people's homes. Counsel, did you want to reserve some time? Your Honor, I, I believe this is this is the time um, that's expiring. Oh, minus I'm those... sorry. I didn't know. It's follow. okay. You've already it's reserved okay. it. I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, so rounding out the CATS analysis, I do want to um, direct the court's attention to the First Circuit where there the court held that absent exigent, exigent circumstances, the warrantless search of someone's lock did not outweigh the privacy related concerns um, of testing a key on a front door. And we strongly urge the court to adopt the First Circuit's reasoning. In my final moment, I wanna leave the court with this question. What sort of world do we wanna live in? In the respondent's world, law enforcement will be able to unlock people's doors without a warrant in hopes that officers will exercise restraint and not do more. However, in the petitioner's world, front door locks will become curtilage of the home and thus Fourth Amendment protections will be properly extended to the locks and Fourth Amendment protections will be extended to many people living in apartment units. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Thank you Counsel. Um, Ms. Shenoy? Hi, I'm here. I can't uh, turn on my video. Um, if the host can please do that, I would appreciate it. Great, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chief Justice, and may it please the court. Akila Shanoi on behalf of respondent. Your honors, looking at the totality of the circumstances in this case, this court should affirm the Ninth Circuit's decision denying petitioner's motion to suppress evidence and find that the reach of the Fourth Amendment does not encompass petitioner's claims for two principal reasons. First, the use of petitioner's key fob to activate the RFID receiver on the door to petitioner's apartment served the discrete investigative purpose of confirming that petitioner had access to one of the units at the Oakview apartment complex. It was not to discover intimate details about the petitioner or of criminal wrongdoing. Second, even if this court finds that a search occurred, the search was reasonable in light of the legitimate governmental interests and the minimal degree of intrusion upon petitioner's privacy. Therefore, a warrant was not required. Post US v. Jones, there are two ways in which the government's conduct may constitute a search implicating the Fourth Amendment. First, a Fourth Amendment search occurs where the government lawfully, unlawfully, physically occupies private property for the purpose of obtaining information. Second, a Fourth Amendment search occurs when the person invoking its protection can claim a legitimate expectation of privacy that has been invaded by government action. Your Honors, this case falls squarely within the CATS framework as there was no physical intrusion when the RFID sensor was activated. Ms. Shinoy, may I ask you a question? This is Justice Kugler. Your adversary, one of his final points, I thought was well-spoken. What sort of world do we want to live in? Do we want to live in a world where police officers or agents of the government can walk up and down hallways of residential buildings trying to find out who lives where? Is, is that really where we're going with this? And Your is that Honor, a good thing? Thank you, Your Honor. Um, so the reason why this court developed the CATS test was to protect against electronic intrusions. Um, just because uh, we have advancing technology doesn't mean that uh, 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 Fourth Amendment falls out of the picture. Um, in these cases, uh, the court, this court uses uh, the CATS framework 
And um, I would like to um, just note that um, in the Kelo case that petitioner brought up, um, that that this court actually uh, applied the CATS framework in that in that case in order to arrive at the conclusion that it was an unreasonable search. Um, it was not the Jones analysis, the trespass framework. Um, in U.S. v. Jones, this court said that in situations involving merely the transmission of electronic signals without trespass would remain subject to the CATS analysis. Here, um, so so, excuse, but you're, um, but first of all, we all recognize that Kilo predated Jones and Jardines, if that's how you pronounce it. Um, but that trespass theory has was part of the founders theory of the Fourth Amendment itself. So that's never gone away. And your opposing counsel um, made a good argument that there was in fact a trespass within the meaning of the Jones and Hardeen case because the fob, the key fob, the lock fob, key fob was used to uh, radiate signals to the lock and thereby open it. How do you deal with that? Well, I, I deal with that by going back to the, the Jones case. Um, there, this, this court acknowledged that the common law trespass theory, which was no longer being used post cats, was still in play, that the uh, cats analysis added to the Jones test, did not added to the common law trespass test, did not take away from it. And still, the, the court, this court in that case, acknowledges that in cases of mere transmission of electronic signals, the CAS framework would still apply. Ardeen's is distinguishable because in that case, an officer trespassed onto, a, um, onto the defendant's property with a uh, drug sniffing dog. Uh, this wasn't a, um, a momentary intrusion where a police officer just walked up to the, the defendant's door and left. Um, in the oral argument in that case, and also a focus of the opinion, uh, this court focuses on the fact that the, drop, the dog was on the property for about five to 10 minutes. They described this technique of bracketing with the dog walking back and forth. So the extent of the intrusion does matter. Here- Council in Har Jardines, um, didn't, the court, didn't we go out of our way to say that anything more than a trick-or-treater or a Girl Scout cookie seller um, was violative of the Fourth Amendment in the sense of a trespass. And, and certainly um, here more was done than just a knock and a wait to see if someone answered. Yes, Your Honor. Again, though, this is a physical intrusion. Um, so the, the area outside of the defendant's home in that case was considered part of the curtail curtilage. Um, a common hallway has never been a common hallway in an apartment complex has never been considered part of the curtilage. Um, and even in that case, um, Detective Wilson briefly stood on that area and there was no physical trespass. Um, so, for instance, if um, we were, con were to consider that the RFID receiver in this case was the cur curtilage, there would be no physical trespass. And then under the framework of thinking that the common hallway is curtilage, we would also not have um, a trespass because this court and no other courts have extended uh, the apartment, the, the privacy concept to the to an, a common hallway. Um, so under the CATS analysis, um, we, we would argue that um, the petitioner does not have a reasonable expectation of privacy. Um, when this court has analyzed under the CATS framework, um, they have, this court has focused on the manner of the intrusion, the information that is obtained and how that information is used. Um, I'd like to focus first on the information that was obtained. Uh, Judge Kubler correctly noted that an address is revealed through means such as talk, talk, talk tax documents and other records. Um, this is not private information. It's information that is regularly disclosed to um, outside entities. Um, in cases that this court has, um, has analyzed, such as Kilo, um, Jardines, Carpenter, Katz, 
knots, Riley, they all, they all have a common theme, which is criminal wrongdoing. In all of these cases, um, this court, the court, the, detect, detect, the detectives in these cases have uh, tried to identify information to provide in a warrant affidavit. Here, Detective Wilson had already spent one month um, investigating the petitioner and um, using an, an informant to find out about uh, criminal wrongdoing. When she, when she um, obtained the warrant affidavit from the magistrate, the majority of the information that she provided was information that she um, acquired through her lawful investigative techniques. Um, the information that she obtained by waving defendant's uh, petitioner's key fob in front of the RFID se sensor was simply his address. It was not- Council, Didn't um, Detective Wilson have adequate probable cause to go in to get a warrant to be able to use the key fob to identify uh, that uh, Mr. Schmidt lived at that particular apartment? Yes, she would have had some sufficient probable cause in order to obtain a warrant to test the key fob. So However, that, does that require her to go get the warrant instead of taking the shortcut? Your Honor, uh, this court has never held that um, an officer needs to use the least intrusive means in order to, for the, reasonable, for the reasonability analysis of um, the Fourth Amendment, uh, test. Uh, this court has never held that uh, an officer has to use the least, uh, least intrusive investigative means to obtain information. Um, and um, this court has also repeatedly refused to declare that um, only the least intrusive means are reasonable under the Fourth Amendment because of the difficulty of administratability. Um, at any point, um, a court could say that um, judges, judges, engage, judges engaged in post hoc evaluations of government con conduct can always, almost always imagine a less intrusive way of obtaining the information. Um, while, while Detective Wilson um, did, could have obtained uh, a warrant, uh, could have obtained a warrant for, to obtain petitioner's address, um, she was also engaged in, um, the, the facts in this case indicate that Detective Wilson was working with the DA, DEA in order to investigate drug trafficking rings. Uh, when we think of drug trafficking rings, we know that um, this involves co-conspirators. And while the record does not indicate explicitly that there was exigent circumstances in this case, um, it would be reasonable for uh, Detective Wilson to have assumed that uh, petitioner was working with other individuals and who might have had access to his apartment. Counsel, let, let me go back a minute. Um, are you are you are you claiming that if there was an invasion of privacy, it was so minimal that it, it shouldn't concern us? Yes, Your Honor, I am saying that. Um, if there was an intrusion, if you do find uh, that Detective Wilson's um, actions do rise to a search, that the, um, that the intrusion was extremely minimal. The only information that she obtained through this, in, through this um, uh, the use of de petitioner's key fob was petitioner's address. It wasn't intimate details about petitioner's home. Um, it was not information um, to... Um, about criminal wrongdoing to support um, the warrant affidavit in this case. Um, you know, all our, we have a lot of uh, lower court rulings on uh, sticking a key in a car door and uh, storage unit padlocks and uh, garage door openers and all those kinds of things. But this is the front door of a person's home. Shouldn't that make a difference? Your Honor, in, in cases such as um, Concepcion, uh, Correa, um, Moses, um, which are the Fourth Circuit, uh, Sixth Circuit, and Seventh Circuit um, cases, um, 
the circuits held that um, it was a minimal intrusion um, inserting a key into a door lock. So there is support on the on the circuits um, that uh, that this shouldn't rise to the level of a of a search. I'm I'm curious about one thing, um, and I could be wrong, but it, it seemed to me that uh, part of your rationale for uh, not finding a Fourth Amendment violation is the fact that. Uh, this door is off of a common area uh, used by certainly uh, at least half of the, uh, the residents of the apartment complex and their guests. Um, now, I, I, perhaps I'm, I'm wrong about that. Is that your position? No, that is not our position, Your Honor. Um, we're not saying that a person in an apartment complex has reduced expectation of privacy simply because they are in an apartment complex. Um, my statements before um, were simply saying that um, in an apartment complex, the curtilage, um, the, cur the area that's considered the curtilage is going to be different than um, a residential property. And, you know, this doesn't matter if a person is a renter or not. I mean, there are people who rent houses, for instance. It's just a matter of uh, property boundaries. And also the fact that um, in an apartment complex, there's just happens to be shared areas. Um, so a person who is living in an apartment complex um, or a person who is living in a um, house would be subject to the same, um, um, same analysis here. Um, we're saying that even if it was a house and uh, a person, uh, a detective had gone up to um, the door and wave the key fob that it still would not be considered a search. Um, and one thing I would like to know that um, is part of our position is the fact that uh, the, the petitioner in this case had a reduced expectation of privacy because he was under arrest. Um, this court has stated that um, a person who is arrested has a reduced expectation of privacy um, when they're under arrest. Just, just because that they are under arrest doesn't mean that the Fourth Amendment falls out of the picture, but it does mean that the police officers can take additional investigatory mm -hmm. steps. Um, when, we, when police officers uh, detain a, um, an individual, for instance, um, during the, the procedures of booking that individual, this court has held that uh, fingerprinting, uh, DNA swaps are all legitimate practices as part of the administration of uh, finding out the person's identity. Um, and these are not, these are minimally intrusive uh, procedures. And these procedures are far more intrusive than the procedure here of just with a key fob in front of a door. And so may I ask you one last question that I've been wondering about, which is, if we conclude there's a, there was a trespass for the purpose of gaining information, do we consider the concept of minimal intrusion or is it a per se um, search at that point? Your, Your Honor, if I'm understanding correctly, if, we, if you apply the Jones common law trespass theory to determine that uh, the information that was obtained from petitioners at, from petitioners home was a search. Um, I believe that um, this court has held that is a, um, that is presumptively unreasonable. So they would skip the uh, reasonability analysis. That is correct, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Um, but as I noted, um, the cases that involve intrusions into homes should not be the decisions that uh, this case, this court uses uh, for its analysis. And that is because this is an electronic, um, electronic intrusion um, and electronic intrusions have not been held to be physical trespasses. Um, any policy concerns that this court might have um, should also be, um, there, there are also no policy concerns uh, that this court should be concerned about by allowing um, this type of a search. Um, this is not the same as uh, SWAT raids, no knock warrants or dynamic style entry. Um, here, 
detectives would simply be able to uh, test a key on a door um, in, a, uh, in, in a circumstances of lawful arrests. Um, and these type of minimal invasions would not elicit the same reaction from occupants that uh, we've seen in cases involving uh, no-knock warrants or SWAT raids, for instance. Um, police will also be able to, um, we should also expect police restraint um, as uh, the, one of the requirements for this type of um, search would be reasonable suspicion or probable cause, um, depending on how this court would like to hold. Um, and in situations not meeting those requirements, the exclusion rule would still apply. Um, in conclusion, uh, this court has said that the Fourth Amendment draws a firm line at the entrance to the house, um, and the government does not propose displacing that rule today. Uh, had Detective Wilson pushed the petitioner's door open and glimpsed inside, respondent would not be able to deny that a search took place. Um, under the totality of the circumstances in this case, uh, this court can answer the question presented in the negative. Uh, the holding, as I mentioned, in this case can be narrow. The government is not asking the court to give the police unfettered access to test a key on anyone's door. Rather, a key that is lawfully seized incident to arrest um, could be used for the purpose of simply identifying an arrestee's residence. Um, if your honors have any additional questions, um, I'm happy to answer them. Not I. Not me either. Thank right. you. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Uh, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Your Honor. I'd like to begin by rebutting a couple of the respondents' points that she made. The first being that a trust, the trespass analysis cannot be used for um, digital uh, trespasses. And there was no authority cited for that proposition. And just because there hasn't been a digital case where this test was applied does not mean that it's impossible and does not foreclose the petitioner's path of using this framework to prove that a search occurred. During the respondent's discussion of the trespass anal analysis, she focused and zeroed in on the fact that Detective Wilson only stood on the porch for a moment. Respectfully, Your Honor, that point, that point and pointing the court's attention to that is misguided because it's not about the amount of time that Detective Wilson stood in front of the door, but it's about what she did in front of the door. And here, by using the key fob to unlock the door, because the, the door, sorry, because the door and the lock should be considered curtilage, that activity in and of itself was the physical trespass. When discussing this framework, the respondent also mentioned that people in custody have a decreased expectation to privacy and that fingerprinting and DNA swabs are permissible, which are um, far more intrusive. I agree, those are intrusive means on a suspect and they are intrusive on a person's body. And in the petitioner's eyes, what Detective Wilson did that day was equally intrusive to the home. To unlock someone's front door without a warrant is equally intrusive. And on these facts, there was no one inside, but what if there had been? What if there had been someone inside who would have been panicked by such conduct? And while the Supreme Court has the opportunity to make a narrow ruling, the Supreme Court, I, the petitioner urges the Supreme Court to think globally when making law that will be applied across the nation. I wanna spend a little bit of time discussing the CATS framework because if the court is persuaded that's the framework to move forward on, um, I wanna ensure that the petitioner has made his argument. We all agree that there was a subjective expectation of privacy because the address was concealed. And when looking at the objective prong, it is important to consider whether or not law enforcement utilized and exhausted less intrusive means. The respondent mentioned that law enforcement is not required to do so. However, under US v. White, this balancing test is a part of the objective analysis. And I urge the court to, uh, to engage in this balancing today and think about whether or not testing the key was sincerely the last available means to, to ascertain this information or if there were less intrusive measures that Detective Wilson could have taken. I also wanna cite a couple of cases. 
In U.S. v. Hicks, the court stated, a search is a search, even if it discloses nothing more than the bottom of a turntable. The respondent kept mentioning that the information that was received was simply an address, and I suppose because it's public or it could be public that there's a diminished expectation of privacy. But the fact of the matter is, it's not just the Sorry, um, I've exhausted my time, Your Honors. Let me let me ask you one last question. Early in your in your argument, you said that you were you were not going to concentrate on cats. You wanted to concentrate on the trespass curtilage argument. Do you still believe that's the best way to go? Your Honor, the petitioner still believes that's the best way to go because we would like the front door lock to be considered curtilage of the home, and therefore, by interacting with it, it would be a trespass. I mentioned cats simply because I wanted to demonstrate how the petitioner has presented enough arguments to be persuasive on either front. Thank you. All right. Thank, Thank you, you Chancel. Um, this session of the court will be adjourned for this time. As the judges take time to deliberate, I'd like to quickly discuss this year's topic. Unlike previous years, the board chose a fictional case. We wanted to choose a case that addressed the intersection of our nation's rapidly advancing technology and one of our nation's oldest and most fundamental rights. That is the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches. This topic challenged the competitors to address real world consequences of the decisions made by our nation's courts. I, along with my fellow board members, have witnessed the competitors advocate with creativity, compassion, and wit. I think each of the competitors exemplifies the spirit of UCI law. The board is very proud of what each competitor has achieved. I also want to take a moment to thank the many individuals that made the oral argument portion of the competition possible. While this year is obviously different, the virtual setting has proven just how wide the UCI law community has grown. This year, judges and practitioners from Hawaii to the East Coast judge over 68 virtual oral arguments. I wanna thank all that took the time to judge. We cannot have done this without the generous support of these great folks. I'd like to also thank the Moot Court Board for their tremendous efforts. Betty, Sharon, Michelle, Matt, Krista, Tom, Emily, and Henry, I thank all of you for your time, hard work, and friendship. I personally know how hard each of you worked over the past year, and I'm proud to be part of your team. I'd also like to thank the many 1L classmates who took the time out of their incredible, busy, and stressful first year to assist in this competition as bailiffs. We could not have done it without them either. Finally, I'd like to thank our advisor, Professor Crossbury Roberts, who always provided the support when we needed. And uh, I, I mean it when I say that we could not have done this without her. Without delay, please join me in welcoming Associate Dean for Loring Skills and Professor of Loring Skills, Professor Crossbury Roberts. She will now present the winners of the Best Briefs and Best Advocate Awards. Hi, everyone. Um, as Chris said, I'm Rachel Crossbury Roberts. I am the Associate Dean for Loring Skills. This is also my 10th year as the Moot Court Advisor at UCI Law School. Um, I First of all, I just want to say how exciting it was to see everyone pull this off and see this come together today. I think it was an amazing argument we watched. Over the years, I've been really astonished by the amount of work that students put into moot court, and that's been especially true this year. So while the judges are deliberating to determine the winner of this year's competition, I get the benefit and the honor of presenting the awards for best brief, runner-up best brief, and best overall advocate. Um, for those who aren't aware, in this in the UCI Law Moot Court competition, students argue as individuals, but they draft their briefs in teams. And so the, the best brief awards go to teams. I'm going to start with the team winning the award for runner-up best brief. So the runners-up are Christy Kang and Samantha Wu. So I want to just congratulate Christy and Samantha. If we were in an auditorium, we would all be shouting and clapping right now. I hope you're doing that at home. Um, and then for the team whose brief got the highest score in the competition, the best brief award in this year's competition goes to Jonathan Rouston and Michael Tetro. So again, congratulations to Jonathan and Michael for best brief and to Christy and Samantha for runner up best brief.
This year, the Moot Court Board decided to add one additional award for best overall advocate. And the way that they um, calculated best overall advocate is by taking the highest combined score when looking at the briefs and the advocate's preliminary oral argument round. So they took the score from the preliminary oral argument and the brief score, combined them to get the best oral advocate award. And that award this year goes to Michael Titro. So congratulations to Michael. So the, that's the, the, the awards other than, again, the awards for this final competition. And the judges are making that decision right now. And so for now, what we're going to do is just wait um, I am also going to spend a little bit of time in closing remarks after the judges issue their ruling, thanking this year's board, um, which is just remarkable, and the judges. Um, but for now, we're just going to take a break and wait while the judges deliberate, and then um, they will come back and deliver their verdict. All right. So this was a very, very difficult decision for us, as some of you might have heard. We did ask if we could declare a tie, and that apparently are not the uh, way the process works. So we had to um, choose, and we will give you more feedback following the announcement. But the best oral advocate is Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Your Honor. Congratulations. Congratulations. And Ms. Shinoi, you're the runner up. But I have to say it was very, very, very close. So not by, by far. And um, then we all commented, which you know, generally is the case that um, you as advocates are um, quite outstanding and as good or better than, um, probably better than most of the advocates that we see on a daily basis um, in our courts. You certainly worked very hard at it. Um, and you covered, you covered all the arguments. Both of you were very good and very responsive um, to both our questions and to, um, the arguments of the other side. I felt it was a very tailored and specific argument. Um, Mr. Johnson, you had really good answers to, I thought, um, Judge Cook, I thought were very good questions, very hard questions by Judge Kugler, right out of the box. And, um, you know, that could have been an intimidating experience, but she turned that very well. I thought your use of Kylo was um, really well done um, in response to my question. And I liked how you broke the, you, you said to one question, I believe it was Judge Wright asked, you said, let me break that down in parts. And then you walked through your version of the analysis. And finally, I thought when you said, let me leave you with a final thought, um, what kind of world do we want to live in? Um, that was a really good point. Um, Ms. Sheena, I thought you did a really great job. You, you went with your strongest argument. You were willing to um, concede points that didn't go in your favor, which some attorneys are not willing to do, but you went with your stronger point. Um, you... Uh, I think you made a very good argument why this was not part of the cur uh, curtilage, which you had to do to really defeat the trespass argument, which your opposing advocate was um, relying heavily on. Um, and you didn't use all of your time, but you didn't need to. And that, that's very good for lawyers to know when they should sit down, you know, when they've got the, they've got the court with them and, uh, just adding more argument isn't gonna win them the day and the judges are gonna really appreciate that um, you didn't uh, hammer in on, on things where that you already had the court. So um, all in all is a very impressive, impressive performance and congratulations to both of you. 
How about if, if I go next? Um, right. One of the benefits of reaching this stage in my career and, and, and my age is that I've been invited to participate in a lot of moot courts over the years. And I have to tell you, this is this one's right up there at the top. I mean, it's just outstanding work uh, by both of you young people. Um, I am so impressed uh, at your preparation and the way you handled this. And uh, yes, I did ask tough questions, but I mean, that's, that's what judges need to do to find out what's going on here. Um, but Ms. Genoy, your grasp of the case law is incredible. You have obviously spent probably hundreds of hours getting ready uh, for this argument. And um, I think you probably win this case, but that's not what we're asked to do as judges of this moot court. We're asked just to talk about appellate advocacy and your skills doing that. Not that there's anything deficient in your skills. Um, it was an incredibly difficult choice to make because you're both so, so good at this. Um, but Mr. Johnson, I'm not sure that if I were arguing this case that I would stick with the trespassory and, and curtilage argument, I think that's gonna go, I think that's sort of gonna disappear in the coming years. And I think, I think to tie it in with your last comment, what sort of world do we wanna live in? That's really more of a privacy cats type of argument. And I think, I think in, out there in the real world, I think you might, might do better with that. Um, I think you had the tough argument to make, because like I said, I think Ms. Shinoi wins this case in the final analysis. Um, and, but you handled yourself really, really tremendously. You both did. I, we would be so proud to have either of you appear before any of our courts that we sit in because you're really so much better than so many of the lawyers that we deal with on a daily basis. And I just wanna thank the university and the law school for inviting me to participate in this and um, giving me the opportunity to see two outstanding young lawyers um, doing a great job. So thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm. I almost feel like uh, Simon Cowell, it's like, uh, um, the other two judges have said it. Uh, you two were spectacular uh, and, and better than what we see all day, every day. Mr. Johnson, I think there is a trial lawyer hidden in you somewhere. Uh, the, what kind of world do we want? <laughs> yeah, that worked. Uh, that worked very well. Um, I will say one thing, um, Mr. Johnson, uh, you don't have a red cape, but when uh, it, during your rebuttal, when you mentioned that she focused her argument on such and such, um, but you only did that once. So I think you understood that that was a no-no, that you don't personalize uh, your arguments uh, by taking a jab at opposing counsel. Um, I thought that uh, your use of uh, the cases, particularly the First Circuit cases, I, I thought that was really quite exceptional. Um, I like the way that you didn't back down. Now, sometimes you can overdo that, but um, you were going to stick to your arguments and, and you did. And uh, that kind of conviction helps you uh, in terms of swaying the listener to your point of view. Um, all in all, uh, your, your rebuttal was in fact a rebuttal. Uh, many times we don't see that. We see people reserve time for rebuttal, but what it is actually are prepared remarks that uh, don't address uh, the opposing side's arguments. You, you didn't do that. You, you did really quite an excellent job at what you were supposed to do and uh, I congratulate you. Um, I too have been doing this since uh, I graduated from law school and I appreciate the work that goes into it. And um, 
there's a fair amount of work that the judges put into it as well. But I want to tell you that uh, the performance of you two uh, this evening, for me, made it all worthwhile. Uh, you truly made this an enjoyable experience. Now, I don't know if that's because we're legal nerds or what. <laughs> but you actually get excited uh, by, by listening to legal arguments, but you two did make this very enjoyable and so hopeful that this is what's coming up. This, this is what we can expect to see in, in, in the future, this kind of excellence. Um, I thank you. I, I, I really do. I thank you. Um, Ms. Shinoi, uh, I, wrote a lot of notes from uh, about your argument. Let me start with one thing. Having done what you all are doing, I, I know how nerve wracking it is at the very beginning, okay? And um, I'm assuming that you were nervous because at the very beginning, you had that verbal tick uh, where there was an awful lot of ums. But as you got going, you know, halfway through your argument, that verbal tick completely vanished. It felt like you were in your element. It really did. Uh, you were arguing like a seasoned lawyer, and I thought you were superb. One of the things that uh, I was really impressed with was that you, know, you knew these cases cold, probably better than anyone I've ever judged before. And you were able to group them by category. Uh, I was really, really, really impressed with, with your knowledge of, uh, of the case law supporting your argument. And uh, I'm going to leave it with one last thing, aside from the fact that you did an excellent wrap up. Um, you immediately picked up on where I was going regarding uh, perhaps greater Fourth Amendment protections to the wealthy, perhaps on their front porch in Beverly Hills, and someone who is living in an apartment complex. You knew exactly where I was going. And you took care of that argument without raising a sweat. I was very impressed. I really was. Um, it shows that you are in tune to your audience. And uh, again, we're serious about really inquiring, can we call this a draw? Because these two kids are really quite sensational and equally sensational other than the fact that Mr. Johnson had the uh, tougher argument to make and uh, Mr. Johnson did it well. But uh, I, I wanna thank you, not just simply congratulate you, but, but thank you for a very enjoyable argument. Okay. So I think, uh, Dean Richardson, do you have, want to say something before I, I close this out? I, I, I do. I, I just have to um, echo the words of our, our judges. Uh, Akila, Aaron, truly extraordinary. I am so proud, so proud of all the work that you put in. I, my only regret is we couldn't be together live. But I didn't even miss that. Based, on, it was so obvious the amount of work that you put in and the arguments that you made were extraordinary. I, I really am so proud to be the dean of a law school with the caliber of the arguments that we heard today. So thank you so much. And I also want to thank our, our three judges for taking the time to be here too. Thank you for, for doing all of this and the incredible feedback um, that you've given to our students and thank you to the Moot Court Board. But I know that Professor Crossgrey Roberts will do all of that, but I just had to say, I'm not supposed to say something at the end of this, but I was so <laughs> moved <laughs> by the extraordinary arguments I, I had to say something to you both to the board and to all of our judges hey i just add one thing i i think you're well aware that i wrote um i authored on behalf of our court uh, united states versus dixon which you guys sent to us as an addendum 
So I was particularly interested. Some of the questions I asked were things that I have been mulling over and did I get that right? And, you know, just wondering how this is all going to play out. And um, in fact, Ms. Shinoi, one of the one questions I asked you was one that we struggled with at oral argument and you answered it very well. I just wanted to let you know that about the minimal intrusion. Um, is I'm questioning whether the minimal intrusion has any place in the property rights analysis um, myself, just as a judge and a lawyer and, you know, someone who loves this stuff. So <laughs> thank you for the problem. It was very interesting. It was indeed. So I get to, I have this space that I'm sitting in where I am the thing standing between you and your dinner, or for a few East Coast people, you and bedtime. So, <laughs> um, so I, I promise I will keep this very short. Um, I, but I just have to add and echo my thanks, um, first of all, to this esteemed panel of judges, Judge Wardlaw, Judge Wright, and Judge Kugler. It's just really amazing to have you with us. You were so plainly, beautifully prepared. You asked tough questions. You challenged our students. Um, in a way that made it exciting to watch. Um, and, uh, and to do this in the middle of a pandemic, <laughs> right? You know, when everything is um, in upheaval, we're just truly, truly grateful. Um, and then I have to again, congratulate our finalists, Akila and Aaron, um, just an amazing job. I know everybody keeps saying it, but um, I literally was getting, I have my phone here and I'm just going to, since we get to do this in this kind of environment, I'm going to say, I got, I got emails about your performance as, you know, as it finished my, the emails started coming in from people talking about how close it was and how amazing you guys were. And um, so it's, um, I, you just should be so incredibly proud of yourselves. Um, and the other thing I want to say to the other people on this call is that, you know, we are heaping praise on these two competitors as we should be, but please recognize that there were many, many competitors involved this year um, who put in hours and hours and hours of work, tireless work um, to be a part of a competition in a year where there's not a lot of recognition for that, right? Because this final one, we're all here together, but there were a lot of rounds that where you had lots of your classmates doing um, incredible work um, behind the scenes and you're not seeing that. So I encourage you to reach out to other competitors and co congratulate them as well. And then finally, I have to offer my deepest thanks to this year's Moot Court Board planning and executing, you may not be aware of this, but planning and executing a moot court competition of this caliber and size is an astonishing amount of dedication and work in a normal year, right? When you don't have to try to do this um, remotely in a pandemic. What this board has done is nothing short of remarkable. I, uh, it's just been, it's truly been an honor to work with this group of students um, I, they know I've said this a million times, so for them, this, they've heard this before, but I seriously keep asking them, is there a way we can convince you to just put off graduating so you can do this all over again? <laughs> um, surprisingly, they turned the request down. They want to graduate, um, but I tried. I did. Um, and so I'm looking forward to the next board being just as wonderful, but you have huge, huge shoes to fill. Um, I don't normally name every board member. I hope you'll indulge me this year because I really want everyone to know. And I know Dean Richardson mentioned them at the beginning, but I just want to make sure you know who to reach out to and congratulate for pulling this off this year. The Moot Court board chair is Chris Lawrence. Our two vice chairs are Sharon Beck and Betty Kim. We had two directors of judicial relations working to get the judges for all the rounds, um, Michelle Emeterio and Matthew Hallman. We had two people who crafted this incredible bench brief and went round after round working on it, Henry Glitz and Kristen Millard. And then finally, we had two directors of internal relations, Emily Abbey and Tom Collins. So again, I just, I had to do a shout out to every single one of them because just an outstanding group of students are gonna go off and do truly great things. And that's it. That's it for this year's competition. Um, the board can now breathe a sigh of relief. The competitors can breathe a sigh of relief. Um, thank you so much for attending this year's 2020-2021 Moot Court competition. 
and we'll see a bunch of you around this time next year. Thank you again. Thank you guys. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you.